руках со временем только став сильнее Но я в твоей бутылке вискари, тут охуенный став в косяке Я та самая страшная день, что привидится тебе в темноте Radio Free Intimate, episode 242. You're fucking cool, pretty fucking amazing, so... Lately, I've been listening to a whole lot of Russian thrash metal, specifically Russian thrash metal from the period immediately before and immediately after the transition away from the Soviet Union. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! I haven't really gone hard on Russian thrash metal on this program since, I don't know, like two Decembers ago, but it is an interesting sort of miniature world within metal. You see, unlike in a lot of other parts of the world, more well-trod parts of the world by filthy Western degenerates, thrash didn't really stop in Russia. Like, you go to America, you go to Europe, by the time the 90s rolls around, you get a few more thrash classics, and then everyone has either moved on to playing death metal or black metal, or they're playing some kind of sellout groove crap. In a lot of the Slavic countries, in general and in Russia in particular. They kept going with the thrash thing, pushing the genre in the whole new directions. For instance, as late as 1998, you got albums coming out like the debut from Easy End, where they're playing something that's clearly thrash metal. It's not death metal. It's not some kind of weird groove metal. It's thrash, but it's not like any thrash you've ever heard. Instead of abandoning a lot of the thrash metal aesthetics, a lot of these really good Russian bands kept running with them and seeing how weird they could make it. Among the whole forgotten thrash metal classics online communities discourse there is a tendency to focus on certain fringe ends of the genre where there's bands that are clearly moving towards more of a death metal or a black metal thing and that's definitely true with people talking about russian thrash i mean you think of bands like ospid I mean, they're basically the demi-lich of thrash metal in terms of technicality and weirdness, and I've seen a lot of discussion about them. Or you got bands like Front, who basically sort of bootstrap themselves into being essentially a death metal band by virtue of how heavy they are, how nasty the vocals are. Even the jigga 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 thing sounds more like something you'd hear on a Massacre album than an Exodus album. And their album Mortal Surgery is great. It's gotten this big, fancy double CD reissue. But the band we will be covering this week, Chorny Obelisk, or Black Obelisk in English, is not one of those kinds of bands. These guys come from a very different end of the thrash metal spectrum. Autism. They're one of those more thrash for the sake of thrash type bands, slightly goofy thrash. One might even call them fun thrash. I'd rather eat your mom's jank ass Salisbury steak than let them through! Shall not pass! Now hang on a second, don't click off that video. When I say that they're goofy fun thrash, they're still a Russian thrash metal band, okay? So even their goofy fun bands are way less and way more. You know, they've got a little bit more of an edge to them. And we like that. But even more importantly, that edginess isn't just in the lyrical content of all these bands. The music itself is really boundary pushing and strange. I first came across Shorni Obelisk way, way, way back when, when I heard the first Shaw album. That was maybe the first Russian metal album I ever heard. I love it a whole lot. And as sort of a session bassist type guy, they had this dude on there named Anatoly Krupnov, but he went by the name Black Obelisk, which was the name of his main band. If you're unfamiliar with Shaw, I did cover them briefly back on episode 150 of this program. They probably deserve their own episode at some point because they're an amazing band. Sound-wise, they're essentially Megadeth in aesthetics and Dark Angel in actual songwriting. They tend to write very long songs with a whole lot of riffs arranged into very epic stacked riff buildups. With the guitar playing itself is much more flashy and kind of mega deathy with all these palm muted triplets, as well as some very quick Peace Cells style solo intrusions. Check out this riff right here, dude. That may in fact be the most Megadeth riff ever written that wasn't actually written by Dave Mustaine. Whoa. 
But the way that they built up to it, the way that song is written, is much more like a Dark Angel song. There's probably something like 25, 30 riffs a song on this album, and the songs are all really long and complicated. Shaw, darn interesting band. And that was where I first found out about Shorny Obelisk, because the main guy behind Shorny Obelisk was kind enough to do some session bass work for them. Shorny Obelisk, however, have a much different story arc to them than Shaw does. Both these bands started around the same time, but the first Shorny Obelisk actual full-length album doesn't come out until 1991. They do have three albums in quotation marks from the 80s. Essentially, there's something between a live album and a demo. And apart from Anatoly Krupnov, they're pretty much an entirely different lineup than what we would get for the 90s Shorny Obelisk stuff. The reason for this odd pattern of releasing live albums as full-lengths is that Krupnov is, or was, a bit of a party animal. And the band sort of kept collecting collapsing after he'd get in fights at shows after uh, drinking a whole lot. Luckily for us, in 1995, Shorny Obelisk put out this album called 86 to 88 that was them doing professional studio re-recordings of a lot of songs from this time period. It gives you a good window into what early Shorny Obelisk might have sounded like. Early Shorny Obelisk was some pretty unique sounding metal. It's very mid-paced and atmospheric, with quite a bit of a post-punk touch given those clean guitars as well as their incorporation of keyboards. The distorted guitar riffs themselves, however, are quite heavy. There's also a whole lot of really weird transition riffs. It's kind of prog rock in that respect. Anatoly's vocals are also quite unique. Sort of this odd hybrid of singing and narration. Maybe somewhat comparable to Dave Mustaine and Megadeth, but honestly, I think Anatoly's got his own weird, unique style. You can definitely tell that Anatoly, the band leader, is a bassist. Bassist and vocalist. Because this is some intensely rhythmic, weird, gothic, slow-paced, vaguely thrash, vaguely heavy metal, sort of post-punk stuff. The main focus is definitely on rhythm and atmosphere much less on wowing you with shredding. But by the time they finally sort of regrouped enough to put out a string of full-length albums, the lineup had completely changed. I mean, obviously Anatoly Krupnov is still there, but on rhythm guitars, we now have Yuri Alexiev. On drums, he brings in Vladimir Ermakov. And then on most of the 90s albums, but not all of them, sometimes they use other session guys. But most of them got a guy on lead guitars and keyboards name of Dmitry Borisenkov. And it is with this new lineup, they finally put out a full-length album that's in a completely new style, very different than their 80s stuff. And yet we're not quite out of the woods yet as far as like weird liminal space between demo live album and full length goes because this first album entitled Stjena or Wall in English appears to still have been seen by the band as sort of a demo because they re-recorded the whole thing in 1994 and they included sections of the original Stjena album as bonus tracks kind of spread out over all their other 90s albums. Honestly I think the re-recording does this material a little bit more justice. The original Stiena isn't bad at all, but the redo of the album is much more in keeping with what they were going for during this time period as far as the overall feel of the music. Good example of this would be the song Ave Kaisar. Praetorians, kill this asshole! See, that definitely sounds like a demo, but you can fix that, right? There we go, much better. Definitely displays their sort of atmospheric riff stacking properly. There's still a big emphasis on having a whole lot of transition riffs per song, as well as incorporation of simultaneous distorted and clean guitar as a major part of the music. But the riffs themselves are much more percussive and thrash-like, albeit way more atmospheric than is still typical for thrash metal. Speaking of atypical for thrash metal, Anatoly's back on vocals. Doing his wacky narration stuff. You might have noticed that pretty much every riff on the song is a variation on the same sort of general theme. Here's a heavier version of it. That sounds familiar. What do you mean? Well, I mean, the album was called Wall. But I don't recall Pink Floyd ever doing any dank thrash metal build-ups with that melody. Speaking of which, here's a really dank thrash metal build-up riff. Very tense despite its atmospheric nature. In fact, it seems like a much more laid-back version of the kind of stuff Shaw was doing almost. 
But I don't remember Shaw doing anything like this. I don't remember any thrash metal band doing anything like this part. I love it though, it's fucking great. A whole lot of very cool post punk styled stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Much in the same way that their 80s material was, there's a whole lot of focus on atmosphere as well as very peculiar grooves. But if you're looking for some hard edge speed metal, don't fret because they got plenty of that. I mean, check out that double bass, dude. This is like an ex Japan song or something. But of course, it's still Shorny Obelisk, so they still gotta go like. You know, all wacky with the start-stop stuff. They're all about that. And when he's not doing his demented narrations, Anatoly is pretty darn good at crafting some catchy vocal lines. Speaking of that, check out the speed on this part. I mean, how does he even remember all that shit, dude? Here's a cool little weird, like, bouncy Voivod-esque off-time part, kind of jumping off of where the vocals start. Pretty interesting stuff, and it leads into one hell of a melodic chorus. I mean, I don't speak a lick of Russian, I feel like I could sing along to this. Very effective, snotty, almost kind of punk-like chorus over that speed metal riff. Unless we forget this band is led by its bassist vocalist guy, we got some dank slap bass shit going on. The guitar playing in this part is super cool. It's another awesome build-up, utilizing like palm-muted notes very high up on the neck, building intention towards. Some excellent guitar soloing. Very Megadeth in terms of cadence, how he's sort of filling in the spaces between the guitar chugs. Also kind of bluesy. Whatever it is, it's certainly unique for thrash metal and kind of metal in general. But Shorny Obelisk is not content with just moving into speed metal territory all tiptoe style. They got plenty of full-on thrash metal songs for your perusal. Total heavier than a brick shithouse style thrash metal buildups all over the place with lots of nice palm muted harmonies and sexy bass fills, but they still gotta be weird about it. So this part's got a really cool interaction between clean guitar, distorted guitar, and his wacky vocals. Watch how the guitar bounces off the vocal line here. Usually a thrash metal band wouldn't let a note ring out like that, but it sure works for parts like this. Going from letting the notes ring out to bringing back some of that thrash metal heaviness from earlier in the song. Speaking of which, check out which riff comes back here. Intro riff from the beginning of the song that they've been slowly sneaking pieces of in during the course of that whole interlude. So subtle you might not have even noticed. But your brain did. Speaking of brainy stuff, here's some more weird Voivod meets Pink Floyd shit leading into an absolutely heavy as balls thrash break, complete with Weird natural harmonic palm mutes, very similar to what Megadeth would do on Tornado of Souls. And of course, an awesomely bizarre guitar solo, going back and forth with like the weird slap bass hits. I'll tell you what slaps, it's just fucking Bane. So there was an example of a thrash metal track that might be too funky to be called a proper thrash metal song. How about a funk song that's too thrashy to be a proper funk song? This one's got a whole lot of interaction between the very sparse rhythm guitar and some really weird full stops, like this one right here. It's like the spaces between the notes mean as much as the notes themselves, man. man. And here's some more of the classic Krupnov weird vocals, but watch how they start incorporating thrash metal tropes like gang shouts. You know, I think I figured out why I like this band so much. It's because they sound like Gargoyle, dude. Specifically the third album from Gargoyle. That one being, of course, Aratama, which I think might be my favorite Gargoyle album. It changes a lot. But for whatever reason, some wacky confluence of influences led this band to sounding a whole lot like Gargoyle. I mean, I highly doubt either band were aware of the other one, but they seem to be channeling the same energy, and I'm glad they're doing so because I really like this weird style of thrash metal. I mean, listen to these dang fucking solos, dude. Now that's Clay. 
more of those cool harmonized palm muted notes leading into a bit of a revival of their old epic heavy metal days like that's a total heaven and hell style black sabbath bass line now that we've established it i think these guys kind of sound like gargoyle we can go over one of the most important similarities between the two bands that being their mastery of very clever songwriting like a lot of the shorny obelisk songs of course are very long and have all kinds of twists and turns due to the prog rock influence but even on the simpler songs that are often you know pretty bare bones verse chorus type stuff they manage to incorporate all these subtle variations that keep it interesting <laughs> For instance, the title track on their third album, Yastayus, another total post-punk inflected thrash banger, but here's how the verse goes the first time it comes around, here it leads into the chorus. Which is total emotional heavy metal at its greatest, by the way. But then that intro riff comes back with that little post-punk drum kill. And after an epic group gang shout, we can get back into the second version of that verse riff, which now has this really cool melodic lead guitar, those same sort of like palm muted choked off notes, added as an extra layer to the proceedings, making it very, very interesting. Leading to a repetition of the chorus and a guitar solo. Which of course is excellent, like all of Shorty Obelisk's guitar solos. But pay attention to this more repetitious part of the guitar solo there, because when that verse riff comes back, they're gonna let that same melodic line color the new guitar layer. See, look, that guitar solo has become part of the verse riff itself, and it gets even more intense when they start doubling up on it, allowing the guitar lines to harmonize underneath that chug riff. And that's a good example of one of their simpler songs that nonetheless boasts some very clever songwriting. Unfortunately, after that album, we wouldn't get too much more of Anatoly Krupnov's own peculiar variety of clever songwriting, because they managed to get out that re-recording of their first album, and then that 86 to 88 compilation re-recordings of their songs from the 80s. And then while he was in the studio recording in 1997, he actually died of an overdose in the studio, which is very sad but also fucking metal as fuck dude but there you go that's shorty obelisk uh i've never really seen these guys be talked about by any metalheads from my part of the world even ones that are into a lot of the russian thrash stuff like ospid and diva and Korotsia metalla and such maybe we can work to change that anyways thanks for listening to the episode and i'll see you next time <laughs>